I mean, uh, I guess walking, well, what is that? Distracted walking, right? Jaywalking, yeah. Um, you've probably seen people do that or something similar. I don't, what's that? Yeah, dangerous. Okay, yeah, it is dangerous. But uh, I wanted to show you that. I've actually kind of coined a term for it, and nobody else has picked it up. I tried Googling it. No, nobody came up with it. But smartphone blindness. <laughs> so you may have seen on YouTube or on TV, they occasionally show these videos where somebody walks into a street lamp, into a park bench. I saw one where a woman was walking along in a mall and went right into the fountain in the middle of the mall. You've seen that one? Yeah. Uh, it can be quite dangerous, actually. Uh, there's been an increase in car pedestrian collisions because of this, so that's not, that's not a funny thing. And then there's this. You ever pull up to a, to a stoplight and look in your rearview mirror? You ever notice how many people have their heads down? Are they all praying? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> now, we might bemoan that folks are so into their smartphones, and we might complain about it. I've done it, I confess. Um, they're not going away, are they? We might wish for simpler times, but those aren't the times that we live in. Technological innovations, including smartphones, they're here to stay. So I want to do a little survey this morning. If you own a smartphone, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, keep your hands up. I see a smartphone in Katie's hand back there. <laughs> if, uh, you, if you haven't raised your hand and you own an iPad, a notepad, a Kindle Fire, anything like that, you can interact with the internet. Raise your hand, okay. We've got a few more, okay. Quite a few more, actually. How about if you own a computer, if you haven't raised your hand yet? How about if you have access to a computer? <laughs> raise your hand. How about if you've seen a computer? <laughs> All right, good, you can put your hands down. Thank you. So you see what that little demonstration did? It showed us how pervasive in our society, how big a part of life all this technology is. Now, smartphone blindness was not something Jesus had to deal with in first century Israel. There are no recorded miracles of him curing smartphone blindness. But when Jesus encountered blindness, he brought, he brought sight. And when Jesus found darkness, he brought light. And when Jesus found closed-mindedness, he brought insight. Jesus did it then. Jesus does it now. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit in, later on in my message about how Jesus can bring us some of that, that sight and light and insight into our lives, including our lives that involve technology, but first I want to take a little bit of time and just look at that story that we read from the Gospel of John. So Jesus and the disciples were traveling along, and they encountered a man who had been born blind, and immediately we see a blind spot popping up in somebody else. In this case, it's the disciples. They're like, teacher, why is this guy blind? They, weren't, they wanted to have blame. They wanted a reason. Somebody's got to be somebody's fault. Was it his sin? Is that why he's blind? Or was it his parents' sin? I wonder about that question. How could the man be, who was born blind have sinned before he was even born? What did he do, kick too hard in the womb? Is this some kind of karma thing? There's a little crossover of Hindu theology got, in, got into the disciples? I, I wonder about the disciples' question, but they have a blind spot because they want to figure everything out. There's got to be a reason. It's got to be somebody's fault. And Jesus says, neither one. It's to show God's power. And then Jesus showed God's power in giving that man his sight. Now, the method that he used, probably not the most sanitary method. Spit and mud, rub it in the eye. Don't try this one at home, please. But it worked. Praise the Lord. It worked. He has sight. It's a cause for celebration. At least it should be. But that's not quite how it turns out. This man's sight brought problems for other people. First, there's the neighbors. That's not the, that's not the same guy. That's just somebody who looks like him. It makes me wonder. 
Your neighbors, did they never see this man as a person? Was he always just a category? Was he just a condition? That blind guy? You know, it's easy to do that. We, I think we do it all the time. We kind of look through someone who's in need or above them or around them because we don't want to deal with them. Maybe we don't want to acknowledge their humanity. I'm sure you've experienced that. So the neighbors don't know what to do with him. Let's take him to the religious authorities. They'll figure it out. And so they take him off to the religious leaders, and instead of celebrating this miracle of new sight, they question him. And they find fault. See, they've got their own blind spot. They're stuck in their rules. They aren't able to see God acting in a new way. And so they actually end up in kind of a paradox. They're stuck. Because if the healer broke the rules, the Sabbath rules, then he therefore must be a sinner. But if he's a sinner, how could he do a miracle like this? They actually kind of go back, fall back on the original thing that the neighbors came up with. It's not the same guy. It's somebody who just looks like him. So they bring the parents in. And the parents have a blind spot. Their blind spot is fear. They're afraid of being thrown out of the community. So they say, he's of age. Ask him. So the now seen man is brought back in for more questioning. Tell the truth. We know the man who cured you is a sinner. I want you to listen to his response. I don't know if he's a sinner or not. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I see. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I see. That is just this pure, unadorned, simple statement of faith. I don't think you could get any purer, more simple version of faith than that. Back when I started seminary, like all seminarians after the first year, I had to go off and spend the summer uh, in what's called clinical pastoral education, where I was a student chaplain, intern at a major medical center. And so we go the whole summer long dealing with everything you could possibly imagine. And I think it was 11 weeks long. And at the end of 11 weeks, you get evaluated by your supervisor and uh, your colleagues. And there's, I don't remember what most of the evaluation said, but I remember one thing. I was told that I was able to look at faith with new eyes. Something I've hung on to all these years. And there was a reason that I think I conveyed that I was looking at faith with new eyes, because I was. I had been absent from Jesus and the church for a very, very, very long time. When Jesus re-entered my life, I saw something completely new and different. I saw this was the best message the world has ever heard. There is a God. This God loves me, and this God forgives me, and I can be in a relationship with this God through Jesus who saves me and helps me and guides me and strengthens me. And all those rules, the ones that I didn't really like about the church, they weren't the most important thing. And I really didn't have to do anything to be claimed by God and loved by God. And in that, I was given new eyes of faith, and I couldn't wait to share the excitement that I had found in Jesus with others. And so I share it with you. There is a God. God loves you. God forgives you. You can be in a relationship with God through Jesus who saves you and strengthens you and helps you and guides you. And all those rules, that's not the important thing. You don't actually have to do anything to be loved by God be saved by Jesus. He wants to give you new and fresh eyes of faith. We don't have to do anything, but we can do things. You and I can say thank you. We can say thank you to God when we worship. We can say thank you by following Jesus. We can say thank you by loving and serving other people. We can say thank you by sharing that good news of Jesus with others. 
And we can say thank you by letting Jesus heal our blind spots. We've all got them. Our blind spots may be from the idols of our culture, you know, wealth and success and pride and accomplishments and accumulating things. That can kind of dim our fresh eyes of faith. Our blind spots can be scars left over from past hurts, including hurts from the church. Unfortunately, a lot of us bear some of those scars from our past experiences with the church. Maybe the church that was overly legalistic, or you experienced personal rejection or diminishment of your gifts. Maybe you just got bored to tears. Our faith can be clouded by our own personal failings or the shames that we carry around. But I want you to know Jesus can clear those clouded lenses. Jesus can restore sight. Jesus can bring light. Jesus can fill us with insight. Jesus can even do this in the technological worlds that we inhabit today. Jesus said, go into all the world, and I think in the 21st century that means to go into our cyber worlds as well. And so we're going to try something new and different today. We're going to take this conversation, and we're going to take Jesus into our virtual worlds, into our social networks. All you people who raised your hands and said you had a smartphone or an iPad or a notepad or a computer, or you could find a computer, you know what a computer looks like, you're invited to be involved in this conversation. I posted two discussion questions on our Facebook page this morning. Simple questions, but you don't have to stay on them. If you have something else to say, say that. But here's the question. What are some blind spots or potential blind spots in your life or in other people's lives? And how has Jesus given you new fresh eyes of faith? Now, if you're on Facebook, I didn't ask you that, but I suspect there's probably at least half of us are on Facebook. And I don't know what the average number of friends is, but I suspect it's over 100. If we start getting involved in this conversation, you have potentially, say, have 100 people who might see you engaging in a conversation that started at church and it includes Jesus. It wouldn't take too many of us to respond, and we have the chance of bringing Jesus into thousands of potential contacts with people. It just goes exponentially. Now, if you're not one of our Facebook friends on Prince of Peace, if you look in FaithWorks, it's going to tell you a very simple way how you can find the Facebook page and how you can become, you can become part of that community. So today, I'm not going to tell you to turn your phones off. I'm not going to tell you to put them away. In fact, get them out if you want. There's a few times during the service where maybe you want to jot off a little answer to one of those questions or start a conversation of your own on our Facebook page. Maybe during the offering, after you've put your, your offering in the plate, you've got, a, you've got another minute or two. Maybe it's at the end of the service. Maybe as we gather around over coffee, pull out those smartphones. Maybe it's when you go home. You choose the time. You choose what you want to say. But as you do, I want you to know this. Jesus will be there, just as Jesus is here. And Jesus told us to go on to all the world, and he said he'd be wherever we go. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.